starting a doc project, any doc project, before we get into the details of this talk, and regardless of our other roles on a software project, can often feel like this image. We're eager to explore the forest and learn about the trees, but we often start out alone, and we almost immediately stop right at the beginning, a bit confused and uncertain about just what we're seeing and where we're supposed to go, where the path even is. But we have help along the way, if we only know how to look for it. Collaboration is obviously the foundation of this talk. And in many ways, the talk's meta theme is about finding more ways for all of us to collaborate. So in the spirit of collaboration, let's first acknowledge everyone who has come before us or who has held our hands, literally or figuratively, <laughs> along the way to actually standing up here on stage and we hope not actually falling over in your fright. <laughs> Some of the people on this list have written blogs, um, trained others, gone a long way toward establishing docs as code as one ideal to strive for in managing software documentation projects. Other people have given us feedback, have said, this is an awesome proposal, but you do understand it's a book, right? <laughs> um, a lot, a lot of people are involved in this kind of work, and we are just lucky enough to be able to stand up here and give you some of our particular ideas about it. We invite all of you to join in the conversation going forward. So docs as code is not a new thing. None of the details that we're going to talk about today is particularly new. But what we are trying to do is to suggest that there are some ways in which we can put together the details to build bridges, to cross parts of the forest ecosystem, to connect them, to see the trees a little more clearly, um, to collaborate truly with a shared vocabulary, and ideally to build a new form of shared ecosystem. Yes, I murder metaphors for a living. <laughs> so let's start with a brief working definition of docs as code. This particular list is taken from Anne Gentle, who has nicely summarized many of her individual blog posts about docs as code um, in this list. So web delivery, continuous integration, which we have heard wonderful things about already um, at this conference, collaboration for documentation using code systems, and content management using those same code systems. But we'd like to add a little more detail right off the top. Um, a few more conventions that have come to be associated with this docs as code approach. Not only do docs use the same system as code, they typically live either together or near the code um, in the repository. They're written in a lightweight plain text markup language that is, at least generally, assumed to be more accessible to multiple stakeholders, another key piece of docs as code, um, than the arcane systems that are associated with what one might call traditional technical writing. Docs as code are built simply to HTML using static site generators or doc generators. And the process, as we've seen in several talks at this conference, is iterative. You don't write once and just publish. You work over and over again on the doc content until you get it ready to publish, just as you do with code. But a little more about writing first. Some of you may recognize this quote um, from the end of my talk um, at this conference last year um, in Europe. It seems appropriate in this different context too, although my point is not to read the entire text to you. Instead, what I want you to do is to notice the highlighted text, the emphasis on research, drafts, edits, reviews. It's a beautiful illustration of that iterative writing workflow. But a lot of steps in this flow are missing from many discussions of docs as code. The multiple kinds of iteration in particular. All too often, documentation is simply one line item on the project plan. And all of this stuff is rolled into that single line item. So how do we reconcile code and docs? A real code, a real doc code model for docs. We talk about what Margaret and I have chosen to call the missing manual. Um, identifying more of the trees. Identifying details that are missing from both workflows. 
mapping those workflows, and trying to understand from that mapping a bit more about what we can learn each from the other. So here's Margaret to help us understand better how we can implement a truly iterative documentation process. Thanks, Jennifer. So um, a lot of people have given presentations that have set us up beautifully for our presentation. So thank you to all of you. <laughs> um, I'll buy you some beer later. Um, so Rachel, just not very long ago, showed us how Docs's code can enable documentation to keep pace with agile software development processes. But by itself, it's not a guarantee of success. If you want to be successful with Docs, the work required to plan, write, and deliver the content also has to be accounted for in the planning and development cycle. At the beginning, like everything else, docs are a line item in the release planning process. So let's take a look at that line item and what it takes to get from release planning to done, entering the forest, so to speak. Um, in the release planning process, all components of the release and sprints are driven by user stories, including documentation. There aren't any surprises there. That means that you can scope doc work at the same time that you scope code, UI, and UX work. It might not be exact, as, uh, the scoping might need to be adjusted, but you can still start from the beginning. Often, the doc release planning assumes the smallest and easiest scope, um, that, that is updating existing documentation and submitting it without further analysis. So if you have a simple debug fix, or if you need to make a correction in the docs, docs is code allows you to do that almost instantaneously depending on your platform. In our case, once you make the change, get someone to review your pull request and submit it, but change is up on your site within probably maybe five minutes, and that's on the long end. It's usually much, much faster than that. Um, so anyway, that's the easiest, and that's what Docs as code enables, is the just really quick updates. Um, but if that's the assumption at the beginning of the release planning cycle, and in fact you have the other cases where maybe you have new features that maybe are um, going to affect other features and also in the case where you're going to have an entirely new product or service, um, if you start with that assumption, the simple assumption, and you leave doc as a line item, it creates a problem when the scope is a lot larger. And I know most people in the room who've worked on documentation projects, this is what happens at the end of the project when suddenly you have to write almost an entire manual or maybe the help system or a large section of the help system and it has to be done you know in 10 days or something ridiculous <laughs> so that's kind of what happens when um, you don't consider all the different scopes so you have to scope it first just like you do with the uh, code projects um, and the second part of the release planning is the design phase um, and like um, product or code you have to have a des you have to have some considerations around design um, what kind of documentation do you need? Do you want, are you going to have user references? Is it just reference? Is it UI text? Is it messages? What kind of content needs to be created? And do you need to account for all the different types in the release planning process? Um, and each type needs a content model that defines the parts, structure, and organization in the content type templates for reference, concept, task. Those are traditional um, topic types, and they may be a little bit different now that we've been doing more things in blog posts and narratives and things like that. But anyway, those need to be accounted for. Um, otherwise, every, every time someone creates a document, they have a new content model, and every topic has a different structure. And that might be fine for individual um, things that are pushed out really quickly, but when you have to integrate those back into a system of documentation, or you find that your individual components need to be extended further, you'll find yourself without a framework. Um, and then you also have to understand the deployment models. Um, how is it going to be deployed? Is, is it going to simply be pushed out to a website? And for a lot, in a lot of cases, um, that's the advantage of the static um, site generators. A lot of content is static. So it's super simple. You don't need a heavyweight uh, content publishing system to publish something that's as simple as a static site, uh, a static page. Um, but, you know, maybe it needs to be integrated in the product, maybe it needs to be delivered to different um, parts of the code base. You know, there can be any kind of, any number of different scenarios. Um, so once you're through the release planning process, and you, everybody that's done development knows that's just the beginning, and you, this, again, a lot of this stuff is iterative, um, you're, you're getting into the development phase. And 
you're going to write, review, and test the content, just like people write, review, and test the code. It's an iterate, iterative process. Um, but like code, when a developer starts coding, they have a developer, a developer environment set up. So if you're going to do docs as code, then you also need to have a doc development environment set up. And this kind of this is a little bit more specific detail on what you get with the um, what your what should be in place in your system in your docs as code system and your continuous integration and delivery system. Um, it docs like code provides a GitHub workflow and the infrastructure to develop it. And the um, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Um, Anyway, you, you have source form, you have decided on what your source is, what you're going to write in, what, what uh, source you're going to use, plain text, are you going to use markdown, restructured text, where are you going to store it? Are you going to store your documentation in the, in the repo, in the repository with the development, uh, with the code, or are you going to have a separate documentation repository? And there's different use cases, but you need to think about that. Um, and again, here's where you're, you have, you actually have content models and templates and that will um, be, be able to be used. Um, and they actually exist, and if they don't exist, well then maybe you need to do some work there before the um, sprint planning starts. Um, the other thing that you need, if we're gonna enable different contributors who aren't necessarily writers, or you're going to expect writers to um, work within a code, coding type system, you're gonna need some information to help them learn how to, um, to enable their contributions, just like you do for um, when you're doing code contributions. Um, and then, of course, that also means some training materials. Um, so now, then we get into the part that we're also familiar with. And it, for me, I think it's actually the fun part <laughs> where you get to actually develop the content. Um, and if actually, it's very fun if all those other things are in place. It can be a little stressful when they're not <laughs> um, or they're, the planning process wasn't quite what it should be. Um, but anyway, so you research um, the content. And re writers research to understand user stories so that they can prepare to create the content, which is the words, images, diagrams, samples, and other components of the documentation product. They also research and communicate with the product development team to understand how those stories are implemented in the code and delivered to users in the resulting product or service. Ideally, this work parallels and intersects with the coding work and is accounted for in the planning and scheduling. Docs as code helps because when, you, when everybody's working in the same environment, developers, and actually I think Paul mentioned this earlier in his talk, the developers can actually write the first draft, literally, and instead of us chasing after them for information, they can actually do a brain dump in a text file and we can start from there and um, do the further refinement and development that's required. So that it can significantly help us, um, our chances of getting to done. Um, so uh, then we create outlines using those content models um, that, uh, you know, basically making sure we're covering all the different things that need to be covered. Then we start our writing process. And then once we write, um, once we get to a certain point, we're going to submit something as a draft. And um, th th here's where the docs is code. Instead of, you know, saving your file and putting it wherever you put your um, current source that it, when you're not doing docs as code, you're going to commit it into a, get a repository um, and then it will be, as soon as you commit it, if you have docs as code environment set up, it's going to build and deploy, get deployed to a staging environment. So you'll be able to see the rendered content um, pretty much immediately. Um, so, yeah. So that's where, and then the next part is, this is where we ran into some really interesting um, gaps, differences. Um, code writes tests first. Everything, they, they have a lot of extensive, extensive testing frameworks set up and things like that. With doc, um, documentation, most doc testing has been manually and it's pretty much been limited to syntax and language checking that's incorporated into the review process. Um, but when you treat docs like code, testing can become a separate component and it can be extended and developed further to provide more automation around document, to get document quali quality and um, functional coverage in your documentation, just like it does with code. And we can use those uh, code frameworks can be leveraged for that. We don't have to create our own. They have to be customized. Um, Jennifer's going to talk more about that a little bit later. Um, so then we get to the review process, and um, you, it's usually been done man manually um, by multiple stakeholders, if you're lucky. 
Um, what I have on the screen is kind of the full service red carpet review process that some of us rarely get to. Um, it starts with a developmental edit, which corresponds to the architecture and design review and a code workflow, and down to the final review where you do final quality checking informed by a quality checklist. Um, contents reviewed against style guides, user stories, product implementation, standards, checklists, just as they are for code. Notice the number of reviews by different people for different purposes. This is a really par important part of getting quality content that can really help your users. And then of course done. And this is the awesome part. As Rachel said, when you use Docs as code and it, everything goes as planned, it's a button push. Instead of your content being built in staging, it gets built in production. And you can go to your retrospective and talk about how you can do it better next time. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer again. Or talk about how awesome it was. <laughs> So what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is look at Margaret's material from a slightly different perspective, um, one that outlines in a slightly different way both doc and code, um, the ecosystems, if you will, and how we can build bridges between them. So let's start with the code, code workflow, which I've arbitrarily given um, the role of the deciduous forest. Um, to summarize, I'm not going to go through every item on either of these lists, but to summarize, as Margaret has explained for us, we've got design, build, test, and deploy. The testing pieces and debugging pieces of this are the ones I really want to call out. We've got unit tests, the ones that, you know, if you're doing your code right or if you're using the right kind of framework, um, really come along for the ride um, with the rest of your code. Debugging, integration and regressive, regression testing, more debugging, and acceptance tests, which everybody says we need to do and very few people actually ever get around to doing in systematic fashion. For one thing, we're still at the manual phase with acceptance testing. Um, and I'll come back to that point um, in a minute. The evergreen forest of documentation. Um, and I'm really trying not to think too much about how I made these arbitrary choices. <laughs> Uh, summary writing workflow. You could think of this as Noren's words translated into a list and given software documentation terminology. We have information architecture, the equivalent of the design phase um, for code. First draft, code stubs, review, revision, and repeat, rinse and repeat um, until you're ready to publish. Margaret's helped us identify the missing items on this list. But another thing that's really where I want to go with this part of the talk, we're really trying to treat docs as code, right? So can code management or code, code workflows teach us a little more about how to help out the doc workflow? How to move from what one might still call a classic writing workflow um, to one that uses some of the ease of a coding workflow. What happens if we actually step, start stepping across that bridge between ecosystems from either direction? What happens specifically if docs learn from code? Yes, this list, I'm awfully fond of these lists, <laughs> um, is one flavor of your standard issue GitHub workflow. And yes, GitHub can help. We can think of it as the trestles of the bridge. Um, other analogous systems as well. GitHub is a not entirely arbitrary choice here um, for both of us. But again, the missing pieces, the trees. Where are the, where are the missing trees? We need standards. We need checklists. We need these things that everyone agrees are important to quality code and quality docs. And for docs specifically, um, to reiterate, again, from a slightly different perspective, something Margaret's already discussed, we need ways to ease the parts that are hard for every contributor. Hard part number one. No matter how many templates um, or content models you've got, the start of a project, that blank page, is scary. But we need the templates and the content models in order to help us get started. We also need some human intervention here, though. We need guidelines that remind people not to be afraid of that blank page, that it's only a first draft. And that, and that that first draft, as with your first iteration through your code base, 
your coat stubs often, um, is never going to be what you actually build and deploy. This is only a draft. It's only the beginning. It could look like this, which is not for you to read. The point is, it's a ghastly wall of text that doesn't, in fact, even make very much sense. Um, but with some content to start with, regardless of which stakeholder has, in fact, produced it, a reviewer can go through and say, well, wait a minute. Does it make more sense to pull this apart into two or three different sections? Um, what do you mean by this? Do you mean this or do you mean that? What on earth are you talking about here? Do we really need this? You can, have, you can start a conversation. You can start a truly collaborative effort on this iterative workflow. And since that's also to talk implicitly about reviews, we can also move into the part of doc workflow that I would argue is quite possibly um, at least something close to a greenfield opportunity. Um, we've heard a lot here um, this, at this conference about doc testing. And Margaret's talked a bit about it. But the fact of the matter is we still have a long way to go in automating all the things that we can automate for documentation. Linters are wonderful things, and they are getting more elaborate and more sophisticated all the time. And you can, people are writing more and more thoughtful and careful rules against sort of the reference linters um, that we're all learning to, to use and love. But they're really only the, the unit tests of documentation. They check for some of the stuff, some of the structural quality that Riona was talking about this morning. I'd argue that they can do a lot more than that, too. That's not a sufficient definition. But where, where are the equivalents of integration tests or regression tests? What happens when you write release notes for a bug fix, and then you move to the next release, and you've got to take those release notes and integrate them back into the main documentation? What happens if you've documented the workaround for that bug in your original draft? How do you fix that? The only answers to those questions that we have right now are manual. But I'd like to think that we can imagine ways to automate some of that testing. Not to get rid of any of the writing workflow at all, but as Rachel so eloquently said, so that we can automate the heck out of everything possible automatable, so that what's left is the stuff that really needs to be done by human beings. And I would argue that, in fact, at least at this point in the history of software development, the last item on this list is probably the most important one, those acceptance tests that are hard at the product level, they're hard at the documentation level. Um, and I don't have time to go into the details of that. We've heard other talks that have, in fact, addressed what I would call the issues around surrounding acceptance tests for documentation, um, notably in Riona's talk. Um, but I think we have ways to go here. And I think it's really exciting if we think about the challenges to documentation testing in terms of these coding tests, because they really do map to some of the problems that we still face with manual review in documentation, where, as Margaret says, much of documentation testing still, in spite of automation, really gets rolled into that thing we still call review. So I guess another point here is let's pull apart review and test for documentation um, as they're already pulled apart for code um, so that we can more clearly look at what automates and what humans do. A vision of a mixed forest with a clear horizon. I guess that's what I'm inviting us um, to contemplate. And now to wrap up, here's Margaret. Thank you, Jennifer. So we've covered a lot of stuff. <laughs> and um, I, so what, you know, what, if you wanted to do this, what does this mean? Um, I'd like to say, I'm just gonna go through these and read them, um, and then I wanna say something about the first item. <laughs> Uh, Docs as code development environment, including the continuous integration and delivery, um, content and models and templates, shared project planning processes and systems. This is actually really important because in my ex in, in the company I work in, um, everybody uses a different process, and we so our project planning was separated from um, the GitHub workflow, and that's actually created a lot of problems that um, it doesn't sound like Rachel, for example, has in her environment, and that was a product of our organization. 
um, contributor, contributor collateral, um, which we already, we've already talked about, establish review um, guidelines and workflows, and then cross-training for co um, contributors. And I put, I put a couple references here. Get for Teams is a great um, resource, not only for, it's for everybody. It's for, right, it's for everybody that has to use Git for um, version control and uh, managing their software. Uh, and it deals with the soft skills and the other skills. And then um, earlier in the conference, David Oliver's talk on documentaring. Some of this, as much writers need to get some help with the coding uh, things that they're not familiar with. And as we've learned, um, developers might need some help with the writing portions of it. Um, so Docs as code by itself doesn't guarantee delivery of high quality, um, complete documentation. But it does enable those working on docs and code to speak in the same terms, share the same tools, and take advantage of the speed and convenience that the continuous integration and delivery workflows enable. But without any other changes, this without any other changes, this improves our chances of keeping documentation in sync with the code fairly significantly. Um, but you know what? It's still hard. It isn't wasn't a walk in a forest <laughs> when we migrated our system from DocBook and XML and Jenkins to our current system, which I don't have time to describe, it was more like carrying a bike through a cornfield. And if you go through this process, you will find that it's very difficult. It's a layered process. You can't do everything at once, and it takes time. And it also takes patience. Um, and probably the hardest part of any kind of change, if, if it's a change, in fact, um, is establishing and maintaining open communication and collabor collaboration across the teams that are involved. Because without that, even if you put these tools in place, they're not going to be used properly. Um, and with that, I will leave you with our favorite forest picture. And that is, write the docs together. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions or are interested in talking with us after, we, we've got our email addresses on here. And I also have a resource slide that I'm not going to show, but it, it'll be in the slide deck. Um, and I know that, I, and I'm just going to say this on behalf of Rackspace because our um, continuous and our documentation platform is available in open source, um, so you can actually use it as an example. And um, you can also, our, our uh, documentation repos are open. So if you're working on this, sometimes it really helps to see somebody that kind of migrated to this model and what it looks like. And then, of course, we always have the read the docs and all the other wonderful examples um, in the open source world of great documentation that is treated like code. Thank you.